I'm going to share some information with you as a participant in a Workforce GPS webinar. Today's webinar is being recorded and it will be made available in approximately five business days on the event page. At this time, if I could please bring everyone's attention to their Zoom screen, I'm going to give you a tour of some features you might need today. Before we begin our tour, Zoom would like us to remind everyone that some features are only available with the most current Zoom computer update or phone app. Throughout today's webinar, you will have a Zoom toolbar either at the bottom or top of your screen. Your toolbar includes audio settings and video settings in the left corner. Moving to the right is the chat feature. I'm really pleased to see how many people have already done this, but if you haven't already, please do share your name, organization, <laughs> and what you hope to learn from today's webinar in the chat with us. To the right of the chat, you'll see the Q&A. The Q&A is where you can submit a question or comment to the presentation team as we do disable the chat about five minutes into the webinar. Next, you'll also see the closed captioning feature. And lastly, you'll see the reaction emoticon feature. This feature allows you to provide today's presenters with emoticon feedback. And yes, you are more than welcome to practice. In 15 days, you will receive an email with a SurveyMonkey link asking you to share your feedback about the information you have learned and applied from today's webinar. Please complete the survey for our presenters as they will use this data for their future webinars. Look at all of those beautiful emojis. I'm loving the practice. Okay, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and launch a quick poll. Please do take a moment to respond to that poll. We are interested in hearing about your experience joining our Zoom webinar today. I'm going to pause for maybe just about 10 more seconds to give everyone an opportunity to respond. Wow, this is some fabulous participation. Thank you everyone so much for taking a moment to share um, your experience with entering the Zoom room with us. Okay, at this time, I am very pleased to introduce today's moderator for our event. Frankie Russell is a lead program analyst at the Office of Trade Adjustment Assistance. Please join me in welcoming Frankie. Hello, everyone. I'm glad that you're able to join us this afternoon. Um, and thanks, Amanda. As Amanda mentioned, I'm a technical expert for, tr for the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program, and I'll be moderating today's call. We have also have um, Sarah Sato, Minnesota's TAA supervisor, her staff, and special guests presenting today. They'll have a special treat for, for us, which involves a panel discussion with employees and an employer. OJT, a, a different view. We will hear from the panelists and their firsthand experiences about OJT as uh, a best practice, their best practice for OJT. What was easy, what could be improved to make the process smoother um, are all things we'll be listening for. We will also hear about the importance of partnerships in Minnesota's OJT uh, success and take a look at Minnesota's work-based learning data. While this information that we're presenting today is specific to TAA and, and the TAA customer, there is a lot here that's applicable for all ETA programs. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Uh, as I mentioned, she's Minnesota's Trade Adjustment Assistant Supervisor. And um, uh, so Sarah. Thank you so much, Frankie. And hello everyone. Minnesota's really excited to be here today. So as Frankie said, I'm Sarah Saito. I'm the Minnesota TAA coordinator and supervisor. And we have multiple staff presenting from Minnesota today. Uh, Thomas Summer is our performance and financial specialist. Honey Yang and Estella Hernandez are both two of our uh, TAA specialist case managers. And my part was easy. I'm done. I'll pass it on to Honey now. Thank you again. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, today, Minnesota will be be presenting on a different view of the OJT experience. Having presented on OJTs in the past, we wanted to bring a new aspect of this learning opportunity for all, including our own state. We've brought together a panelist <clears throat> to help achieve this goal. As an FYI, we want to let you know all our previous presentations and forms are available on the Workforce GPS site and you can find them directly on our 
Minnesota Forms website. We will be inserting those site addresses in the chat box. For the agenda, we will begin with a quick overview of Minnesota's OJC history and performance data by Thomas Summer. Next, we will move to the panelist portion facilitated by Stella Hernandez. This portion will be the main event and we will be dedicating a good 20 to 30 minutes to allow our panelists sufficient time to speak. We will then move to our final topic, a retrospective view and program improvement. And finally, we will wrap up our presentation to allow the remainder of our time for questions and answers from our attendees. So let's begin by moving to our first agenda item with Thomas Summer. Thank you, honey. Um, greetings, everyone. First off, I'd like to give a big thank you to USDOL uh, for inviting Minnesota to present at this event. I'm excited to be able to be a part of these discussions regarding on-the-job training participation through trade adjustment assistance. Um, to give a bit of historical background regarding OJTs covered under Minnesota TAA, I look back at Minnesota's data from 2015 to present. Uh, Minnesota TA OJTs cover a wide variety of occupations, including electricians, production directors, industrial engineers, and HR managers, just to name a few. Geographically speaking, our OJT partner businesses have tended to be located in small to mid-sized cities around Minnesota. As indicated in the bar chart, Minnesota experienced a noticeable increase in OJT particip participation in, in 2019, and we were able to sustain some of those gains throughout the pandemic. Um, I looked up Minnesota's 2023 numbers and we are on a similar trajectory, trajectory as the previous year. I believe that increase can be attributed to Minnesota TA's focus on outreach coupled with a clearer focus on OJTs. We improved our processes and updated our materials. The increase can also be attributed to the to the partnership with our WIOA partner organizations, who in Minnesota we, we refer to as dislocated worker providers. We often rely on the dislocated worker providers to identify potential OJT businesses, as well as case managers, or as Minnesota calls them, dislocated worker counselors, who are working directly with trade affected individuals to craft a plan using labor market data to increase chances of positive outcomes. Since our jump in participation in 2019, Minnesota's TA OJT completion rate has been right around 86% and our average starting wage is approximately 24 or 36 an hour. Uh, yeah, and now we just wanted to get a quick understanding of everyone of everyone's experience level with OJTs. So we're gonna do our first poll and I will pass it along to Amanda um, for the poll question. Wonderful, thank you, Thomas. I am launching that poll now. If you would please take a moment to respond, how many OJTs has your agency had in the past year? And the responses are rolling in. We'll give this maybe another 10 to 15 seconds to make sure that we can get the largest response possible. Okay, maybe about five more seconds and I'm going to go ahead and end that poll. Thank you so much, everyone, for your participation. Okay, I am now going to share the results and hand it over to Estella. Oh, wow. <laughs> thank you for that, um, Amanda, and thank you, Thomas. Next slide. All right, so now it's time for our panel introduction. Uh, panelist, please make sure that your camera is on and give us a wave as I introduce you. I'd like to start with uh, introducing Deb Hallman, who is a career counselor with the City of Duluth Workforce Development, our WIOA partner. Deb has been in this role for almost 14 years and brings her expertise to us today. Our business panelists uh, from ST Paper are Laura Moulter, Human Resource Lead since September of 2021. And with her, we have Corey Peterson, who is a Recycle Lead Operator at ST Paper and has been an OJT participant since August of 2022. 
Welcome to each of you. And now let's get started with our questions. All right, so first we'll start with our WIOA partner, Deb Hallman. Deb, from your perspective, as a dislocated worker counselor, um, what has your experience been like working through the OJT process? What stands out in your mind? Deb, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, so when I start working with dislocated workers, um, I hand them one of the letters that TAA has created so that they can share that with employers that they're applying to um, and get that process started. Then we work on, you know, some more career exploration and doing the paperwork to enroll them in the program because um, it's, it's a really difficult process. I don't want to say difficult. There's a lot of paperwork to do and it's very timely. So if an employer wants to hire somebody, they want them to start Monday, but it's already Wednesday and they have to have that contract signed and be enrolled in our program. Um, before we're able to approve an OJT. So just giving them that um, letter will help. And then the employers oftentimes will reach out to me. I really don't have much experience with the contracts themselves. So I usually refer them to TAA. And the TAA specialists are fabulous at connecting back with the employers and answering any questions that they have. Thank you for that, Deb. It, it sounds uh, kind of like sometimes you feel like it's a rushed process for you. Sometimes, um, but I think it's it depends on how quickly that employer, employer wants to onboard them. And usually that's fairly soon. So, mm -hmm. um, and we've been able to pull it off, I think within a couple of days. So we just don't want to do that all the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that speaks to, to the great work that you do, that you can pull that off. Um, our next question for you, Deb, can you share with us what the process looks like when you first connect with a business um, and, and the uh, worker or the laid off worker about that specific OJT? And in other words, describe to us um, your process or the process uh, for your agency um, for the OJT. Well, I think that's where I, I hand the letter to the dislocated worker. When I hear about a layoff, if it's a small layoff, I'll reach out to the employer, see if I can set something up where I can come and talk to them in person, mm -hmm. um, answer any questions they have about the dislocated worker program, share the information about OJTs at that point in time, but starting to build those relationships. Um, because I think that that is key in doing anything with employers is having that two-way conversation um, and just making sure that the employees know about the OJT and how helpful that can be to get them into a job where maybe they're lacking a few of those skills. Okay. And then once you make that connection with the employer, what happens? Well, I'm going to go to the experience that we had with Laura and her team. It was a large layoff with Verso. Um, and so we were notified through I warn, I believe, and rapid response included us on every meeting that they had with Verso. Um, they were all virtual because it was the beginning of COVID. And so they had a face, um, they had a name and contact information on who they can reach out to. Um, and Laura and I developed a really good relationship, I think. And so she made sure that people felt comfortable reaching out to me or she would reach out if they had questions. But I think it's so important to build those relationships early on. Um, and it started out as a project. It turned into um, a TAA um, eligible employer. And so um, I worked very closely with the dislocated workers in the TAA program on getting all the paperwork completed for their um, training application or making sure they have the OJT and um, can connect with um, the employer and show them how important that is. Great, thank you for that. So what, in, in your opinion, contributed to the success in building um, that? Like what was the biggest thing that you feel uh, contributed to that success with that relationship with Laura? I think it was the um, 
being included on all of the rapid response team meetings, all of the TAA meetings. Um, I almost started feeling like one of the family. <laughs> and um, that was a large layoff. And I want to say there was, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Laura, but I want to say there was 230 workers and we enrolled 122. And wow. 77 of those were enrolled in training. And of those in training, 22 of them were OJTs. Um, and most of them, I think, were with ST Paper, who bought the old Verso plant. They're doing totally different paper now. But um, so I think it was a huge success because of all that communication. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Deb. We will come back to you. And now we're going to ease on over to our business. Um, we'll start with Laura. So this question is for you, Laura. Did you learn about OJT through the Dislocated Worker Counselor, or how did you find out about OJT for TAA-eligible affected workers from, from your experience? Can you share that with us? Absolutely. Um, you know, as, as Deb said, ours was a, a large layoff, or we shut down the plant in 2020. It was Verso at the time, and uh, we filed a, a warn notice, as we had to do, and um, I think it was probably Sarah Saito who contacted me initially and said, you know, hey, this is this is a big event and we're here to help because I was clueless to, you know, what we did when we shut down. And so, you know, we developed a rapid response team and and the the help was incredible. We had, you know, as Deb said, Deb from dislocated workers, but we also had uh, folks from boy. What would you say, Deb? Four or five other um, geographic areas right around Duluth who were available to help people and uh, kind of split the load a little bit so it didn't fall all on Deb right away. But what that gave is that everybody attended presentations that we held here at the mill. So um, Deb mentioned it was COVID. So I would hold them in person, spread out you know, in a conference room, because I thought it was important for people to be able to really ask questions. And then everybody would attend online and uh, kind of facilitate through the process of what happens when you get laid off and what resources are available. And, you know, just learning about it there was so incredibly helpful. I wouldn't have had any idea how to help all of those employees without that, that resource. It sounds like you there was like a really good network system set up to bring it all together then. Is that what kind of what you're like? Absolutely. Yeah. They they great support me, network. When can we have these? And I set up times and invited people and they got everybody there to to support the workforce and got me materials to use. And it was really a really good response. Thank you. And and then our next question for you, Laura. Can you share how working with the OJT participants impacted the business for ST Paper? Um, yeah, I definitely can. Um, you know, what I what I didn't mention last time, too, is, you know, when you said how I learned about it, mm -hmm. is I get to attend, I think, the same session over probably five times each time. And it really is true. You know, we have to hear something, you know, five times for it to really sink in. And so that that helped me have enough information. So two years later, when the plant get, is starting to get ready to start up, it has a new owner. You know, I'm like, OK, so we have this uh, TAA stuff available and some of it can help the business with startup. And uh, that allowed us then to hire people earlier because we didn't actually start up the mill and start running till January of this year. But we started hiring people at the end of 2021, which, you know, again, gave us training time uh, and time to absorb because we put in, as I think Deb mentioned, it's a whole new process, manufacturing process that we put in. And folks are in different roles and a more leadership role than they were. And it gave us the ability to get them in sooner and get them trained. I mean, when you can get 50 percent of their wages paid, I, oh, what an incredible assist for the business. Thank you for that. All right. So now let's move over to Corey. Corey, let's give you an opportunity uh, to provide some information and some feedback here. Your first question 
do you recall hearing about OJT when you were at the TAA information session? Because we're throwing a lot of information at this group of workers. So um, what do you recall from those sessions? And did it stand out? And if it did stand out, what made it stand out? Well, for me, you know, going to the meetings, you know, prior to that, you're thinking, what am I going to do now? I'm too young to retire and I'm almost too old to start over. So you're, you're kind of caught in the middle. So you're, you're kind of freaking out thinking about what you're going to do. And then you sit down in the meeting and I guess I remember, you know, seeing the slides and, and hearing people talk about TAA and on the job training and my ears perked up thinking, okay, maybe there's something there for me. Right away when I heard the, when I heard that there's something out there to help me that's being offered, I felt much better. And I thought, okay, and I, I, I jot, jotted that down on a piece of paper that I had to look more into that right off the bat. I mean, it's just right, right there. You just, you knew you had, you had a lifeline. You felt like you had a lifeline when you heard that. So. Yeah. Did you attend those in person or was it a virtual information session or did you do both? I went in person. I'm kind of one of the people I, I like to be in person, COVID or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want to see what's going on and in real time and face-to-face -face kind of thing. Thank you. And your next question, the next question that I have for you, Corey, is how has this OJT experience been able to help you grow your skills professionally? Yes, um, when I left the mill, I was lead operator in uh, another department, uh, similar to what I was doing, but very different. You know, the difference between driving a, you know, a truck and a, a semi-truck, you know. And it, it is I'm giving the opportunity now to train in this new process, the recycle process, and learn that system. Um, you know, and it's been going on going on for a year now. And there's a lot to this. It's not something that you can pick up in a month or two months. You know, there's there's things that you won't see for a year, maybe even two years. It can happen with all the equipment that has to run in, and run in, in harmony with each other in order for it to run smoothly. And so it's. Yeah, it's helped me grow my skills. I've learned a whole different set of a different department now and, and you know, I'm very happy with it. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing with us, Corey. Um, our next question goes to Laura. Laura, what was your biggest worry or concern going into this partnership with OJT? And how do you feel about that partnership now? I probably started alluding to it in one of the earlier questions is I, I had no idea, you know, what to do with, I guess I would say any state agency or assistance, I just didn't understand any of it. So um, the presentations helped a ton. And then, you know, I was off for about three months when we shut down. And when I came back, one of my first jobs was to say, hey, how do I, how do I get people back? And how do I, how do I get uh, the OJT is going. And um, I think Sarah, Sarah Saito started helping me initially, gave me some samples um, because yeah, I, I just didn't even know where to start. And mm -hmm. so sample training plans, what they would look like. Uh, everybody with TAA was really helpful with their guidance. Um, and as Deb said, you know, they turn those things around very quickly for us so that we could get people onboarded and hired uh, very quickly. And and so the, the partnership has been really, really good. I think initially I was just, the biggest worry was I had no idea what to do. And uh, they they helped me through, they walked me through it. And it's it's been a great partnership since. Would you say then that the, that communication, that emailing back and forth, the phone calls, the one-on-one -on -one coaching, that was key in making that such a positive experience for you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, just having a having a name and somebody at the end of a phone to help me out. I'm a phone person. We did a lot with email too, but you know, just kind of talk through things was really, really helpful. And like I said, everybody's been so available. Thank you. And now we're going to move back to Deb. Deb, we haven't forgotten about you. We have a question for you next. Deb, from the viewpoint of a dislocated worker counselor, how can the dislocated worker program and TAA work better together and collaborate to increase OJT participation? 
um, in your, you know, any ideas that you have, um, any thoughts about that or recommendations that you have? Um, I think that um, doing some type of marketing to let employers know that it's available. We try to talk about it as often as we can, but I don't think it's enough. Um, but I would also like to learn how to fill out one of those contracts so I can better help the employer when they do call with questions. Um, you know, sometimes they have to call TAA, leave a message, and they want their answers, answers today. So if I had a little bit more knowledge, I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you for that, for that idea and that recommendation. For you, Laura, from the viewpoint of your business or a business, um, do you have any suggestions or recommendations of what TAA can do to help continue and grow these OJT um, partnerships, not just with your company, but with other businesses as well? Well, uh, you know, as, as Deb said, is, is there a way to get the information out there in front of employers? I mean, if I hadn't been involved with the Verso shutdown and the rapid response group, I really would not have known about the OJTs. And out of, you know, we, I think we had 22 OJTs just here with ST Paper. Um, Corey is probably the only one who would have uh, brought the sheet of paper into me and said, hey, I'm eligible for this. Um, I think I don't, I don't think any of the rest really realized what was out there and available for them. You know, they had, they had sometimes found other jobs, but they weren't as good a job as here. And so when they were able to come back, you know, I'm like, hey, you're eligible for this. And they were very happy to participate, but they didn't really have that information available at their fingertips. So it's not coming through the employees like I think we would all hope, you know, we we give the information to the employees so they can bring it to employers, um, but it's not necessarily making its way there. So, you know, whether it's a flyer, like Deb said, or, you know, I'd say if we as employers would learn to, to work with the agencies more and just learn ourselves, but I don't know how to get that message out there that there's stuff available. I mean, I just mm -hmm. realized it without it, and I don't know if I would have taken advantage of it. So I, I don't have a great answer there, but I think, you know, it's a, it's a way to definitely get them to, to understand what's available. Thank you, Laura. And Corey, um, back to you. Do you have any suggestions to increase OJT participation coming from the viewpoint of a laid off worker? So think of yourself back in that situation. Um, what recommendations or ideas do you have to share with us? Well, like Laura has stated, you know, if, if we had a sheet of paper, a flyer, something to bring to a potential employer that doesn't know TA, it, it, TA was very successful here at this mill it, because of Laura. You got to understand that because she she understood the process because she went through the end, the, the beginning of laying the people off, and she cared enough to keep going. And we contacted her and would talk to her, and she gave us all the information. So that was a very important thing, and she understood it. I went to a couple of job interviews at larger jobs. One was a railroad and one was a chemical factory. And they were very good jobs. And I was hired at both of them. And the first one I, I, I brought, this, uh, brought up on the job training, CN Railroad, they looked at me and, nah, we don't want to do the paperwork. You're one guy out of, out of hundreds of guys. We don't want to spend any special time on you. I, I don't care. They hired me anyway. The next place uh, I brought it up and they just looked at me and, didn't quite. I said, "Well, I'm eligible for on-the-job training stuff. They pay for half of my wages, and they, they they too were like, I've got enough paperwork to do. I don't want to do any more. So if we had a sheet of paper, uh, something that showed how simple the steps could possibly be to show us a potential employer, then they might jump on board and say, Hey, we'll take advantage of that. Heck yeah, you know." Thank you, thank you for that, um, Corey. Also, I'm just wondering, Corey, um, word of mouth is like a big. Um, promoting tool uh, for TAA. We, we like to tell participants, um, share this information with anyone from your company that you know that's been laid off in, in your same situation. Um, 
And I would like to know, uh, does is that usually how it works? Did you share the information of, of what you were doing? And I know that it was a big, you know, because it was focused in that specific area with Verso that a lot of people knew about it. But did you ever reach out to friends who maybe you felt like, hey, this person hasn't heard about it. We should really share this information with them. I did keep in touch with some other employees over the time period we were laid off. And I asked a few of them, what are you going to do? I said, there's that on the job training stuff. I said, are you, are you bringing that to other people and other employers? Some said, yes, they've tried it. A lot of them, they were basically on my team, kind of uh, the, the decided to take the, the schooling and take the two years of additional schooling because I had to bring them to the retirement age, let's face it. <laughs> they said, well, I'll do, I'll do this till I retire and get paid for that. So some of the guys would rather have the schooling done. So it depends on what age group you were, you were following in, but mm-hmm. the other ones I did talk to say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm trying to use as much as I can. I don't really know of anybody that outside that, that got a job because of OJT at a different place other than here. I do not know that right now. Great. Thank you so much, Corey. And that is our last question that we have for our panelists, but hang tight. Uh, don't leave. Um, We're going to come back and see if we have questions for you later on in our presentation. So right now, I would like to take a pause as we conduct another uh, poll. Amanda, I'll pass that on to you. Great, thank you. I am launching the poll now. Hopefully, everyone will be able to see it on their screen. And it asks, what barriers does your agency face to establish OJTs? And again, we will leave this up um, for a few seconds so that everyone has a chance to weigh in. Wow, wonderful responses. How about another 15 to 20 seconds? Thank you so much for your participation. Okay, we have had several hundred people weigh in. And so at this time, I am going to share the poll results. And I would like to hand it over to Honey Yang and I will be launching the PowerPoint once again as well. Thank you so much everyone for participating. Thank you, Amanda. And of course, thank you to Stella and the panelists. Now, moving into our final segment before we open it up for questions from our attendees, I would like to first acknowledge that our OJT efforts may not always result in a successful OJT contract. For example, a TAA specialist had been working on an OJT and was at the very tail end of getting that OJT contract completed when they received an email from the HR person at the company stating that they decided to forego the OJT. Needless to say, the TAA specialist was disappointed after putting in all that work. This is something that will happen to all of us one time or another. However, please do not be discouraged by failed attempts. Just keep building those relationships and think of ways to continue to promote OJTs. A success story that we are excited to share about is a worker who was laid off from a large company called Electrolux. In 2019, Electrolux had over a thousand people who were laid off. The company allowed on-site informational sessions and was very engaged in working with rapid response, dislocated worker, and TAA teams. We did several presentations in multiple languages to ensure that all workers clearly understood the available benefits. One of the human resource staff members who worked especially close with TAA staff for those sessions and provided uh, updated worker lists over many months. Um, the entire Electrolux plant had closed and the when the HR person was laid off, she was able to utilize the OJT benefit where she was able to get a higher HR position at a different company. She successfully completed her OJT and because 
of her familiarity with the TAA and dislocated workers programs, she was able to hire other Electrolux employees for OJTs at her new company. By building and maintaining the relationship between Electrolux HR and the TAA team, everyone benefited. And Minnesota considers this a win-win. The person completing the OJT, the new employer, and the TAA program win from situations like this. Our hopes are that TAA can share business information with our workforce strategy consultants so they can continue to work with these businesses for their labor needs. Minnesota's approach has really been to work on building quality relationships, not only with the trade affected workers, but also with the dislocated work counselors and different business partners as well. And we truly believe that building those quality relationships has been the key to our success. Next slide, please. Minnesota has been looking ahead to how we can provide, uh, improve our processes and strategically get information to the right people. Last August, we brainstormed and launched four projects for improvements. What you see on your screen are projects that are currently in progress. The goal is that once implemented, these efforts will result in an increase of TAA participation overall, including OJTs. For the first area in technology, Minnesota is using a form previously presented by Oregon, the Think Differently form for this item. The form was personalized to Minnesota and went live January of this year. Also, under technology, we have a group working on improving our case management database to help us identify TAA eligibility at the dislocated worker point of enrollment. Next is employment un is unemployment insurance. We have a group working on increasing collaboration with unemployment insurance. Third area is for informational sessions. Our group works to individualize virtual informational sessions for the workers and will be offering these virtual sessions at different times of the day per feedback from the workers themselves. The goal is to be more flexible and accommodating to the workers and make it easier for them to attend. And finally, under other, we have been working on our internal processes since January 2022 to streamline them and to ensure consistency and a smoother onboarding for new TAA staff. And that would conclude our on the job training, a different view presentation. Thank you so much. And I will now pass it back to Frankie. Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for your questions. Let's go right into the chat. And um, first, let me just say uh, my apologies. Uh, TAA stands for Trade Adjustment Assistance, the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program. Um, our customers are, um, we serve workers who have been laid off as a result of trade. Um, so, uh, you know, trade activity. So if, if a worker has lost their job um, because that work has gone overseas, um, there's a two-step process to becoming eligible. Um, the, the company or the union files a um, petition on behalf of those workers and the workers covered by the program are then um, entitled if they're in, eligible individually, if they pass individual eligibility criteria uh, to receive benefits and services. Um, the benefits and services we offer are uh, training, job search and relocation allowances, um, employment and case management services, and and um, and um, and also the um, the state you know works with workers to make sure that they 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 are uh, you know under rapid response and other activities to make sure workers are cared for. So that was the first question. OJT um, Rachel, my colleague, answered that question on the job training. So um, we've got that one. Uh, the next question that I'm reading that I see here has to do with uh, best practices for using OJT in the context of registered apprenticeship. Um, I actually put a fact sheet in the chat 
um, to respond in response to that question. Um, the next question talks about eligibility before they get a letter, if they're not TAA customers. Um, uh, do you guys, panelists, Minnesota, do you guys want to answer that question? Sure, this is Sarah. Yeah. I can take that oh, Sarah. one. Oh, sure. Yeah, great question. So for Minnesota Trade Adjustment Assistance, we only share that letter with people once they've been determined eligible for the TAA program. So if that doesn't answer your question, let me know, but we do keep it um, just to that audience. Okay. Um, so th there's another question about the letter, Sarah. It says, is the letter a job seeker provides to employers a standard form shared federally, or is it something that Minnesota created? Yeah, also another good question. I honestly don't remember who initially created the letter. I know at least in Region 5, our upper Midwest region, uh, multiple states in this region use the similar letter. Um, but we're happy to share it, and we can put the link in the chat. And we're always looking to improve our forms and letters. So if your state wants to personalize that letter, if you have ideas for ways that we can, we can improve it, we'd love to hear it too. I also put a, a link uh, to the OJT toolkit that's on our website that actually has um, a template of letters in that in that as well. So that was um, um, sent sent out. Um, this one again. The next question talks about a template of a letter. Um, we did respond to that. Again, uh, trade adjustment assistance. And again, my sincere apologies. Um, the trade adjustment assistance is what TAA stand stands for. Okay, next question talks about, um, I thought TAA entered a freeze or termination in June of 2022, where workers were laid off after that date could not receive aid. If that wasn't the case, what is the change that went into effect uh, on 6-30, 2022? Okay, so the, 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 the status of the program is that it is in a phase-out termination status under current law, and that means that um, we are not able to process any additional petitions um, for a trade adjustment assistance. However, the department continues to receive petitions um, covering workers. So we're not able to process them, but, but most importantly, states are required under the term, while we're in termination, to serve workers who were certified, um, who were covered by certified petitions um, prior to the termination date. So if it was, if June 30th, 2022 was when it entered uh, on July 1, entered into termination. Any worker covered by a certified petition prior to that date is entitled um, to, to find out about the program and is entitled to apply for work for benefits and services depending on um, their eligibility and the criteria that we require under that. So there, there are thousands of workers out there. We're finding very um, innovative processes that states are using to find workers um, who fall into this category to make them aware um, that they are are uh, entitled to those benefits and, and services, and um, and and to find out you know their eligibility and and offer on the, uh, these types of trainings uh, to workers. Okay, so um, the next question says, uh, in our region, we deal with affected workers not being dislocated. Um, if a business closes because they want jobs in the same field as hospitality. Um, so do you guys, uh, Sarah, can you speak to what happens if workers wanna change, uh, I guess, a, a different industry or different fields um, as a result of being after they're affected, after they're laid off or dislocated? Sure. So sometimes we see that an industry is so hot, there's a lot of jobs available, the economy is strong, a person may leave a job before they're ever dislocated. And in that case, I would consider them not eligible for TAA because they never had that qualifying separation date. But if they did have a qualifying separation date and they want to stay in that industry, we often look to see what the skills gap is, maybe for an on-the-job training or even occupational skills training. Sometimes we actually just got an application similar in this situation this week. So a person was doing payroll work at their layoff job. They didn't have any degree or training in it. They kind of just got trained by that employer how to do it. 
they got laid off. Now they're looking to become a payroll clerk or specialist and companies want them to have that training, uh, like an official degree or some training. So we're going to fund a one-year certificate for payroll clerk. Um, for hospitality, it's tough because there's sometimes not a degree that's required, um, but we been on the job training might be a great opportunity because within the hospitality industry, there's such a diverse there's such a diverse kind of work that a person could do, whether it's hotel or restaurant or spa or something else. So you could figure out what kind of work they were doing, even in the hospitality industry, what skills are they missing or what's that skills gap to work as a in an OJT at this other company. So if that if that's not helpful, let me um, or just let me know and we can clarify that. And I just uh, would like to add really quick too that that's where working with Deb or our WEO partner, the Dislocated Worker Counselor, um, becomes really important because we want that um, laid off worker to to meet with their counselor and and they will discuss what the options are. Let's look at these, you know, this career. Let's look at the labor market information you know, what, what is it that your goal is? And let's see if we can work and, and then work on that uh, training plan that then will be submitted to TAA for approval. So that meeting with their counselor is really super important because that helps them understand what they're applying um, to do for training and, and, you know, what the potential for wages will be with that and, and is that suitable for them, et cetera. So, um, you know, just, just to let you know that that's a very crucial part of the whole process. Thank you. Um, I just want to interject to uh, one of the key, one of one, one benefit that I left out of the list of benefits that trade offers is uh, wage supplement. So we do um, what we call uh, alternative or uh, reemployment uh, trade adjustment assistance where certain workers, workers older than 50 years old who actually, um, for older workers who get additional, uh, get new employment, we will pay up to, to um, the difference. There's a stipend that pays a difference between um, the old and uh, and new wage up to ten thousand dollars, or depending on which program um, the the worker is covered under. So that's also something that we offer, or that benefits uh, can can be for eligible workers. Um, again, uh, so the next question, Sarah, you answered this. It's about your. Um, uh, it says, well, I think generally when a, a company layoff occurs, what is the process for pulling together a rapid response team? to those who are impacted. Um, so you wanna just quickly elaborate on? Sure, that's a really good question. In my experience, every state kind of runs rapid response differently. So I'll just speak for Minnesota. We, our TAA, our trade adjustment assistance team works very closely with our rapid response team. We share biweekly meetings. We have a staff member who is dedicated as a liaison between the two teams. So she and I and another TAA staff member, we, we meet weekly um, or even email or call each other in between. So, you know, oh, we just heard about this large layoff. Um, it's possibly trade impacted. Minnesota recently redid or kind of personalized a form that Oregon had originally created, and they had called it a think differently form, which is very effective when a rapid response or another staff person is talking with an employer about that layoff to get them thinking, oh, is this, are these layoffs possibly um, impacted by foreign competition? So instead of just asking, uh, do you think this job or these jobs are being lost because of foreign competition? Yes or no. And then moving on to the next question, it really goes into, has this company been bought by another company recently? Uh, is there, are there imports that are impacting this company? So we found that form to be really effective that our rapid response team members would implement in their conversation with the employer and then bring that conversation back to the trade adjustment assistance team if there is possibly some kind of foreign competition impacting those layoffs. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, okay, so the next question I think was, uh, Deb, uh, Sarah, you actually answered that one too. It's about, um, uh, do y'all work with uh, WIOA, WIOA OJT clients? So um, you, I think you've already elaborate, answered that one, but do you wanna, anything else? 
Sure. And actually, I would invite Deb to speak up. Um, Deb is our dislocated worker counselor, and I know a lot of dislocated worker counselors work in multiple programs. So I wonder, Deb, do you work with the WIOA funded OJTs also? And if so, do you want to elaborate on that? Um, we do. We don't have a huge response in the area for the OJTs, but um, we have done them with our regular dislocated workers as well. And we used, I saw a question in there about seeing the letter. So we actually tailored the letter that TAA created, and that's what we give our um, WIOA customers as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Deb. Um, Sarah, you went ahead and answered the next question as well. It talks about uh, someone being confused about whether, you know, what happened there in terms of the company using OJT funds to bring in um, laid off workers. Could you, you want to elaborate on that? Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, Laura's company, it's called ST Paper. There was a large paper mill in Duluth. And Laura, correct me if I'm wrong here, because it's my understanding. Uh, there was a large paper mill that was going to close. And then ST Paper opened, creating a brand new product. So um, it's different machines, different kinds of skills that are needed, two separate companies. And that's how we were able to take the impacted workers who were laid off from company A, it was called Verso and have them do OJTs at company B, ST Paper. And I see Laura came on. Do you want to clarify or add to that for us, please, Laura? Yeah, I'll clarify a little bit. Um, you had it right. Um, Verso was the owner. They actually shut the mill down. Uh, the mill was shut down from July of 2020. And then ST purchased the facility May of 2021. They didn't purchase the business. They just purchased the, the buildings and all the equipment. And then they uh, converted it over to tissue versus paper and a fully new process, just like you said. But every single employee who was hired here was hired new with ST. There was no continuation of employment because the mill had a big, a big shutdown and a big gap in there. So that's how it all worked out for everybody to be able to come back under that. It wasn't purchasing the business with the employees. Okay. Thank you, Laura. This next question is for you as well. Just could you talk a little bit about your experience um, in creating a training curriculum to support OJT? Yeah, I certainly can. Um, you know, the first one was the hardest because I didn't know what to do, but it's, um, you know, basically we just looked at what is someone going to have to learn to, to learn this job. And we were able to put it, we, we took it in small pieces and then placed it into large chunks of learning um, and then established how many hours we expected that to take, um, added them up and submitted it as a plan. You know, it doesn't have to be as elaborate as you might think, you know, it's not okay, and here's all of the training modules that we're going to use to train the people, because it's on the job training, so you can use people's experience, and it's just figuring out what are the, what are the chunks of knowledge they have to learn, and we're going to train them on the job, and, and so, you know, as I'm trying to express that, because I think employers might be very scared of saying, well, I, I don't have the time and the energy to put together this huge plan, but it doesn't have to be crazy hard. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, the next question um, is directed either for Estella or, or Sarah, but the it says, does a VR counselor find out, how does a VR counselor find out about what companies are looking for um, in ind individuals for OJT opportunities? Estella, you're um, muted. Estella, you're muted, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was just saying that actually, I think that uh, most areas, um, you know, like say, ex for example, Deb's area, the um, counselors will go out and seek um, employers or they know of employers. Um, they might, you know, have past OJTs they did with specific employers um, and they actually um, have that knowledge. Um, and so, so I think that's part of it. Um, anything you want to add to that, Sarah? 
I think you're right on. And again, this is where even in Minnesota, we see differences between different regions of the state. So sometimes a region may have staff who are specifically uh, assigned to do those business or employer relationships. So they go out and tell them about the services available, kind of sell their product or see how the employer is doing and how we can support them. Um, our office is all centralized. So the TAA staff in Minnesota are all in St. Paul and we don't have that local contact. So we rely really heavily on our local offices to have those relationships with the businesses. And going back to the section of the presentation that Thomas presented, we have seen higher successes in our smaller to mid-sized cities. And I think that's likely why is because when you live in a smaller town or in a smaller community, you have those relationships and it's maybe easier to build that trust or that relationship and to stay on people's radar um, when they're looking to hire or possibly facing layoffs from a company too. So I think that relationship is key. Yeah. And I just want to add to that um, kind of a plug in because we've been, we've been mentioning this to Sarah in the past, <laughs> our TAA team is that we would act, even though we're centralized, um, we would like to, TAA staff would like to go out and actually visit employers and, and you know, go out and visit Laura and have a tour of the company. Um, because again, it's really important, I think, to have those relationships because Laura goes to conferences maybe, and then she can say, hey, you know, well, Minnesota, and then share that information uh, kind of that networking, um, you know, uh, key that you're using to to get people, number one, um, interested, and then number two, reach out and find out more about it. And so amongst our team, we have been, you know, throwing that idea out is like, maybe we should get out and do this more, because then we would have that, you know, they'd have that face to face relationship with us. And we're just not central staff where nobody ever sees us because we're central staff. Come on up. <laughs> what was that, Laura? I said, come on up. We'll take it. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Um, my colleague, um, Rachel, just put a, a question in. That's a little bit, might be out of order, but I'm going to go ahead and answer it. It says, um, does TAA assist workers in traditional careers? What about non-traditional careers? And in that, you know, uh, the TAA program does assist workers um, from any certified worker group, uh, any certified group. So training can be for nearly any in-demand uh, occupation, you know, based on an assessment of the worker and the labor market uh, need. So that that was there. Um, the next question uh, talks about uh, co-enrollment. So co-enrollment co between WIOA and trade are mandatory. How is everyone navigating that in, in their respective st um, states? Well, for Minnesota, I know that co-enrollments, like it's always been, as far as I know, um, it's the only way that I've known that Minnesota has done, has done, you know, business. So I, I mean, I think it, that's just the way it's always been in Minnesota going back maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Um, I haven't been here that long, but um, that's as far as I know. So <laughs> we don't know any other way of doing it. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question is just generally about more clarification about what TAA is. I'll ask one of my colleagues to pop um, the link to our website uh, in the chat to reply to all there. Um, this is not a, co a question. The next, the next question says, not a question, but in my capacity, it is just important for workers and businesses to know the information that is provided to us um, so that they can have the knowledge handy ahead of time. Employers don't care much about much for funding stuff at the last minute. And that's been that the, the that um, uh, responders experience. So do anybody want to second that or acknowledge, you know, acknowledge that? Well, I think Laura and Corey, um, you know, said as much in, in their information when they were talking about that, that, you know, having the information ahead of time um, and knowing about how the program works and, and what the benefits are, I think is really important. Um, and hearing the information more than once. So, uh, you know, and, and if Corey's still there and, and Laura, you can jump in. Yeah, 
Yep, uh, we we agree with that too. I mean, hearing it more than once is what what helped me through it for sure, and I think probably Corey too. Yeah, me too. You know. And you guys have stressed over and over the relationships. That's such a huge difference having a face and you know having people behind the information is huge. Okay. And a lot, you know, the fact that a lot of uh, we had these meetings and there's 